Thanks, Mohan, and uh, thank you very much. And today I'll speak about disrupting the disruptor, finding the next uh, big idea. And I'll try to give you an idea of what's happening in India in the world of digital technology and why it's so special and so unique and why it has such a big impact on our business. I think there are three fundamental trends I will talk about. How India is going digital, we keep hearing about it, but I want to put the facts and figures at your disposal on how India is becoming digital, which means paper is becoming paperless, cash is becoming cashless. The second thing is how is GST becoming business compliant and why that's so strategic for the economy, what's the impact of that. And finally, a very important issue is what is the role of data in India's future? Because data is, everybody knows, is the most strategic asset of the 21st century. Today, huge battles are being fought all over the world about data. The big issue, as uh, Mohan mentioned, is rise of internet giants who have huge amounts of data. On that data, they're able to apply AI and keep getting better. So fundamentally, what is India's strategy in terms of data to be a powerful country in the age of data and AI and machine learning? So I'll talk about three different things. The first is, of course, how India is going digital. What's important to understand that India's digital journey is happening at population scale, which means it's happening touching a billion people. It's not about a few people in a, one part of the country, but the entire country is, is becoming part of this digital revolution. Just to give you the numbers, 1.21 billion mobile connections, 1.19 billion people with Aadhaar, 582 million unique bank accounts, which means there are 582 million bank accounts to which people have linked their Aadhaar number uniquely. About 462 million internet users, 375 million people on social media. So you're really seeing for the first time technology at population scale. A billion people are getting in some way impacted by this technology. Jandan accounts, a program of the new government, has gone up 10 times in three years, from 30 million accounts to 300 million accounts. As I said, about 582 million unique accounts, 850 million accounts have been seeded with the Aadhaar number. This is an amazing thing that 850 million bank accounts have been seeded with the Aadhaar number. So there's a dramatic expansion in bank accounts. There's a dramatic expansion in the use of Aadhaar authentication. In 2017, Aadhaar authentication, which is the act of somebody going to a place using the Aadhaar number to verify the identity, that system did 10 billion transactions. 10 billion transactions in one year, which is 5x the number of car transactions that we have at POS machines. So this is now the largest transaction processing system in the country with 10 billion transactions. This is coming from all kinds of users. This is a huge jump uh, just in, in a matter of one year. And the use of Aadhaar to open a bank account or open a, get a SIM card or buy a mutual fund. Last year, the total number of transactions for KYC was 3.2 billion. So 3.2 billion KYCs happened by somebody who opened a bank account, somebody who opened a, got a SIM card, bought a mutual fund, etc. So there's been a dramatic expansion in the use of KYC. And the thing with KYC is dramatically reduces the cost of acquiring a customer and it has implications I'll talk about later. And of course, teledensity has gone up dramatically over you know, 1.19 million uh, these things and you know, huge increase in speeds. My friend here will not like it, but we can say it's the geo effect. Right, Balaji? And uh, so we are seeing the dramatic, and India has already become the world's largest consumer of mobile data in the last one year. UPI. UPI is in the news because of this thing about WhatsApp and Paytm and all that. UPI is doing more transactions than credit cards in 18 months. In other words, credit cards took 18 years to reach a certain volume. UPI has reached that same volume in 18 months. That is the speed of disruption which is happening in India. And demonetization played a big role in this because pre-demonetization, the transaction volume of UPI was only 100,000 a month. 
But after demonetization and the government pushing for digital transactions, the Prime Minister launched Beam and so on. To last, uh, last month in January, UPI did 152 million transactions. As you know, uh, WhatsApp came live on that about two weeks back. And I expect that by December of 2018, UPI will be doing 1 billion transactions a month. And so India will truly be on the road to cashless transactions. This is about what's happening on the consumer side. The second thing is what's happening on the business side and why GST is important, not just as creating a single market, but the technology and data implications of GST are very important. Now, obviously, GST, there may have been challenges in operationalization, but the fact of the matter is, for the first time, 10 million businesses are on one single database. 10 million businesses on one database. There are about 6 million B2B businesses and another 4 million retail and composition scheme businesses. So 10 million businesses, which means on the same platform, there's a large company, Mr. Bajaj's company, and the neighborhood hairdressing saloon in your neighborhood who's paying service tax is also on the same platform. The first time we have unified the system to create one database of 10 million businesses. And what's remarkable is that this system has already collected $50 billion in taxes in six months. So this is really a huge success. But what's important is that it is a system which is based on a single tax, but the key thing is the buyer gets input tax credit on the tax paid by the supplier. That's a fundamental principle. And it's all powered by an API-based platform called the Goods and Service Tax Network. Now, it's important to think about how to make this as simple as possible. And currently, you know, the government is looking at simplification so that rather than making tax filing a separate activity, can tax filing be a byproduct of business activity? Now, as you do your business, can you make it happen? So, idea being that as and when you create a sales order, sales invoice, you upload that to the GST system, the buyer accepts, input tax credit is given, and you get tax uh, benefits. And then you don't even have to prepare a uh, return. The system can generate the return based on the invoices that are there. Now, why is this important for the society is that this will create rich digital footprints for businesses. Think about this. They're very, very important because the biggest challenge we have is how do we give small businesses access to credit? And as you know, the Indian banking system only gives money to big guys, and you know what happens there. So how do we make sure that millions of small businesses get credit? And for the first time, the data available with the GAC system can be the basis for credit. Because when you file your return with the GST, you're filing at an invoice level. You're actually saying, these are the invoices that I ship, and these are the payments I made. And you can then ask the GST to give your own data, which you can then give to your lender. In other words, in theory, all the 10 million businesses on GST will have deep digital footprints which they can use to get loans from, their, from, the, from the banks or NBFCs. And uh, this is going to be a very big thing. The same thing is going to happen with other systems. So suddenly, data is going to be used as a basis for credit. And this is not data about assets. This is not collateral-based lending. This is data on business flows. This is flow-based lending. So fundamentally, a small business with no assets can still use its flow to get credit. Now, this is a very, very important thing that's going to happen in the Indian economy. And this is very important because you will democratize access to credit to small business on the basis of data. And that's why when you think about the next 10 years, think of India going from being a, today India is what you can think of as a prepaid economy. 99% of mobile connections are prepaid. Prepaid is a great invention of a mobile industry where you paid in advance for your minutes. So in effect, mobile companies were collecting money ahead of giving you the service. And the reason for that is individuals don't have credit history, and therefore you, you made them pay in advance. The big thing in next 10 years is India will go from being a prepaid economy to a postpaid economy. Think about it. As both consumers and businesses get access to credit, 
you're going to go from a prepaid economy to a postpaid economy. And why that is important is that data will enable small business to get access to credit so they can grow faster. Data will enable consumers to get credit because they have a history of payments. So both the buyer and the seller is going to get access to credit based on data. And that's going to be the source of growth. And Rahul ji, I must say, your son has done an amazing job in Bajaj Finance in using these trends. And that's why that 100,000 crore market cap and all that, he's done a great job. So we're seeing a whole new era where data will be used for these things. So this means that Indians are becoming data rich. Now it's very, very important to understand how India is different from the West on data. When the West implemented technology, the rise of the internet companies of the last 15 years happened in an era where the Western countries, where e individuals were economically rich before they were data rich. In other words, the per capita income in the US in the year 2000 may be $40,000. And therefore, the business models that emerged, the Facebooks and the Googles, uh, used data to sell ads to you or to sell products to you. And that's how they created these huge half a trillion dollar valuation companies. So you business models that emerged was people use data to sell to you or people use data to show ads to you and made money from that. So your data was used to sell to you and that's really the challenge that we have. But in India, Indian consumers and Indian businesses will be data rich before they are economically rich. It's a very, very important point. If your per capita income is $1,500 to $2,000 per head, the data that you as an individual will have will be as the same as an American because you're using the same smartphone, you're using the same digital payments. So the data is the same, but your per capita income is 120th. Similarly, a small business will be a very small business by global standards. The data of your business will be as rich as something abroad. So you're going to be a situation where Indian consumers and Indian businesses will be data rich before they're economically rich. And therefore, the business model of the future is not using your data to sell to you. It is you using your data to improve your life. And lending is an example of that. I use my digital footprint to get a better loan. I use my healthcare records to get better healthcare. I use my degree certificates and skills to get better skills. So for India will be the only country in the world where the data is becoming inverted and the benefit of the data will go not to a large company or the government, it will go to individuals and small businesses. And this is unheard of anywhere else, which is why we have to visualize how this will be, because this is going to create huge amount of opportunities for Indian businesses. And all this is all powered by digital layers, identity with Aadhaar. We now have a system of making everything paperless. Payments are going electronic. I mentioned to you that UPI will do a billion payments a month by December. All the tax layer happens through GST. So B2B businesses will have electronic records. And finally, we have something called a consent layer, which allows an individual or a business to ask for his own data. For example, if I'm a small business, I can ask the GST system to give my invoice data, which I can then share with the bank and get a loan. So all this is a digital stack, it's called the India stack, which is at the heart of the disruption which is gonna happen. And the India stack is there for everyone. India is the only country in the world which has a payment architecture which uses no credit cards or debit cards, but everyone has access to it. So broadly, when you think about India, there are three categories of people. People who have smartphones, people who have feature phones, and people who have no phones. And you need to make sure that every one of them, every one of these billion people can participate in the economy. So UPI for smartphone can be used by anybody with a smartphone. So all this WhatsApp and Google Tej and Paytm and Phone Pay are all examples of smartphone applications, but that's used only by the 250 million people or 300 million people who have smartphones. But what's interesting, and this also again was a consequence of demonetization, that now 
feature phones can also do payments. The same UPI payment you can do on a smartphone, you can do on a feature phone. So the 350 million people who have feature phones can also do UPI payments and they can be interoperable. So I can be on a smartphone and somebody else can be on a feature phone and we can make payments to each other. So that means 600 million people can make UPI payments. And then for the people who don't have phones, they have other numbers. And with Aadhaar number, they can do an EKYC and open a bank account. And then using the Aadhaar number and the bank account, they can go to any merchant who has something called Aadhaar Pay, which is a mobile phone with a biometric reader, and they can either withdraw cash or make a merchant payment. So what you have is a stack which allows billion people to participate in the payment industry. And this nowhere else in the world we have this thing, and this again was a consequence of the demonetization when we had to build something, India had to build something very quickly. And then another huge thing is the government has been very hard in promoting direct benefit transfer. Now there are, hi Sunil, there are 314 government schemes that use this thing. 400 million Indians have received some kind of cash transfer into the bank account. First time electronically money is being spent without anybody touching the money directly from the government's account into a person's account and he can go and withdraw it anywhere. This is a revolution that is happening on the ground and you know billions of uh, 100,000 crores or more has gone into people's account. Now DBT has been used for LPG subsidy, DBT has been used for uh, scholarships, a form of DBT is now being used for fertilizer. So over time, more and more products will be sold at market price and the difference will go to the bank account. The next phase of DBT will be used by the state governments. So you will see that state governments, now there's a proposal that all state governments give electricity subsidy as DBT. Why is this important? Because if electricity subsidy goes as DBT, then the electricity board is no longer responsible for subsidies. So they can operate on market principles. So you're unbundling the subsidy from the product. So electricity and water in the next five, 10 years will go to DBT. So, so the entire economy will unbundle the subsidization of people from the product industry. And that will allow market forces to be there because then companies can compete on price and uh, competition and value. And those who need to be subsidized will go through the cash route. So this is a very, very important structural change which is happening and has impact on all your businesses because every business you have to think, how will DBT affect my, my business? And the other important thing is because of that India stack, you can suddenly lower the cost of delivery. So earlier, to do a KYC for a mutual fund cost about 1,000 rupees. Now to do a KYC for a mutual fund, it costs only 5 or 10 rupees. Earlier, because the cost was so high, unless the investment was 3 lakhs, it was not worth getting a you know, guy into a mutual fund. Today I can get even somebody with 1,000 rupees to buy a mutual fund and I can still be profitable. Which means the market grows from 5 million businesses, 5 million households to 100 million households. That's why because of the technology, you're going to see the financialization of the economy as more and more people have access to low cost products whether the bank accounts, loans, mutual funds, etc. There are already 80 flow-based lending companies, startups already there, all trying to figure out how to take advantage of this. The mutual fund industry has added $83 billion. The, just the SIPs is $1 billion a month is getting added from domestic mutual funds. All this is possible because it's become so simple to get a new customer uh, into the system. And of course, uh, KYC being used by Vodafone and Geo is dramatically accelerating the pace of this thing and there's been a 9x growth in mobile data. So all this means that you're going to have massive financialization where people will have low cost access to financial products. So that's going to be a huge thing. So India will go from being data poor to data rich very quickly. Massive amounts of data which they can use for their own benefit. And the important thing is what I said earlier, that India has something called electronic consent. This has been notified by the government and a version of this is being done for all financial sector companies. So a consumer can ask a data producer to give his data to the lender. 
So think of it like this. I can ask my bank to give my bank statement, give it to the lender. I can ask the GST to give my GST records, give it to the lender. I can ask income tax to give my TDS returns, give it to the lender. Suddenly, my lender can construct a very rich digital image of my financial activity and then decide I'm, he's worthy of a loan. And all this can be done in real time. It's going to happen like instant. And because that is how we think that we are going to really bring economy back on track. Because once millions of small businesses using their data get access to credit, that's how the economic revival is going to happen. And we think credit at scale is really going to unlock the Indian economy because you'll have millions of borrowers, thousands of lenders, and this is being already being done. I mean, many of the companies, Bajaj Finance, HDFC, are all doing this, but you're also seeing many startups doing this, and therefore you're going to see very, very exciting times when this whole thing will change. But this is not just about credit. The same infrastructure can be used for health. The big challenge we have in India is, in the world is, how to create an interoperable system of health records. The US spends you know, trillions of dollars on health. They're not able to solve this. But we have a chance to solve it, because today, you get your lab reports, you have your hospital records, you have all kinds of things, and they're all different paper. But tomorrow, using this infrastructure of consent, you can get all these aggregate combine a single health record. So I can, when I go to meet my doctor, I can get my lab reports electronically from two labs, give it to my doctor for a special consultation. So this ability to create electronic health records is also possible with the infrastructure that we have in India. So this impact of this is not just on credit, but also on healthcare and many other spaces. So the key to this is what we call as consented data sharing. And that's why the term used is data democracy. The Indian strategy on data is about how to use data to empower people and small businesses. How do small businesses and individuals who are data rich but economically not so well off can use their data to improve? It's not about a few companies accumulating the data to sell to you. It's about how millions of companies and a billion people can use their data to improve their lives. And this will happen in lending, it will happen in health, it will happen in other financial products, it will happen in education, because you can take your skill certificate and go somewhere else and say, look, I've got this skill. And this is the heart of what's going to happen. And all of this, on this data, which will be massive, you will then apply machine learning, deep learning, and AI to provide very pinpointed services to everyone based on their unique needs. And this is something which will show the world how to create change. And all this means it's non-linear. That means it's not that last year we grew at 5%, next year we'll go at 7%. Suddenly something will change. You know, so gradually and then suddenly. We saw that with UPI. UPI was just 100,000 transactions in October of 2016, before November 8th. And then by January, it was 152 million transactions a month which is already you know, catching up with cards and all that. And by December, it will be 1 billion transactions a month. And suddenly, everything will be paperless. So this is the point, that change will happen very quickly, and the price of services will drop, and data will be available for people to use to improve their lives or improve the business. So this is the kind of change which will happen in financial services, health, television, etc. And therefore, when we think about disruption for the next 10 years, we need to understand this unique infrastructure of digital innovation that India has and how it will be transformational on every business that we do. Thank you very much.